So good morning and good evening to everybody and welcome to this, the last of the plenary sessions of the conference, which I'm very pleased to say is being given by Professor Rob Aldridge of University College London in the UK. So just to introduce Rob, so Rob holds a chair in public health data science uh, at the University College London. So he has research uh, aimed principally uh, at looking at equitably improving the health of the public through the application of data science and public health research. So in doing that, he leads a, a very cross-disciplinary group uh, working across all the areas that uh, are required to do the kind of work in this complex area of data science. Um, and within that, uh, and looking at equity, he is particularly interested in invisible populations that uh, are often missing from research because they're difficult to research. These are groups like the homeless, those uh, uh, um, uh, misusing substances, the imprisoned and migratory uh, populations. Uh, recently, um, uh, as many of us have been doing, he's turned his attention to coronavirus and particularly uh, he's set up a, a really interesting study uh, virus watch and health equity study, which, um, as I'm sure he'll go on to uh, talk about, is part of his further explorations of equity uh, across various health domains. So um, I think that's where I'll, I'll stop, but just to say that we're very pleased uh, that uh, Rob is talking to us today. The topic of his study won't be a surprise, it's health and social inequalities. Uh, so Rob will be talking for 20 minutes, uh, and then we've got a good 10 minutes to discuss the kind of issues that he's raised. So uh, welcome to you, Rob. Thanks very much, Chris. Let me share my slides. Does that come through okay? That's fine, thanks, Rob, yeah. Perfect, great. Um, thanks very much, Chris. Um, yes, uh, uh, it, was a, it was a perfect title for the talk that I was invited to, to discuss today. Um, so using linked data to understand and improve health and social inequities. And this really is the core theme of what I've been doing in, uh, in, you, in the application of data linkage for the last uh, 10 or so years. And as you very nicely described, the particular rationale that I've been using linked data for is to be able to use and highlight the, uh, the populations that we know are at the extremes of health and, and social inequities. And they don't typically appear in the routine data and statistics that we have at our fingertips. And data linkage is a particularly useful way to get, um, to highlight and make these invisible populations visible. So, just, um, so we're all, I'm sure very many of us have, have, have uh, seen slopes of inequality. So this idea that as you uh, become uh, less, uh, less rich or poorer, your work health outcomes are worse than the average population. And, uh, and this is often described as a slope. Um, but we've been doing, in our work, working with particularly in, with people experiencing homelessness, uh, drug use uh, and imprisonment, we noticed that those individuals didn't appear within these routine statistics, or if they were, they were they were kind of missed within the average. And so, back in uh, about four or five years ago, we undertook a systematic review to understand well what are the mortality outcomes in what we called an inclusion health groups. And this is the idea of people who are experiencing uh, homelessness, drug use, sex work, and imprisonment. And we looked at the international literature and uh, summarized the standardized mortality ratios for those populations and compared it to what we found elsewhere. And so we, what, we, what we described and what we found was rather than a slope, but was a cliff. So off to the right of the screen, you'll see uh, the standardized mortality ratios that we found for these populations. Um, so whilst the, the difference between those in the, uh, the least deprived are down at the, the baseline, uh, the comparator group on the left of the screen are around one, um, and in those in the uh, highest, uh, poorest groups in, in, in 10 over to the right of the screen are about one and a half times the standardized mortality ratio. What we found when we summarized the global literature for these inclusion health populations, they had eight to 12 times the standardized mortality ratios. And we felt that this looked like a cliff of inequity. And these individuals don't appear within our routine statistics. Um, and so they're essentially invisible within those. 
So we, we, the work that we've been doing over the last five or six years has been trying to understand in the UK in particular, where the focus of my work, where I'm based, how do we make these populations visible? What do we do to, to highlight these problems? And really importantly, how do we do something about it? And I think that doing something about it is a really important point. Um, so we have right from the start taken a, a slightly different approach to, to our work. And we formalized uh, some, of, some of the work that we've been doing recently in a, li a literature review led by Helen Pinio at UCL and, and the uh, Bartlett Institute. And what we did in this review, we wanted to look at um, how others have been undertaking transdisciplinary research models. Because the work that we've been doing with data linkage requires very technical, very um, you know, public health epidemiological skills, but we also need to understand and work if we're going to solve these problems. We also need to work collaboratively with experts by experience, people who've experienced these, um, these adverse outcomes and these, these really severe social in inequities. But also we need to work with the policy makers that can make a difference, that can take the data that we're generating, take the evidence that we're producing and turn it into action. And so we've been kind of doing this for the last five or six years, but we wanted to formalize it and understand what is a transdisciplinary research model and how can this be used to improve the health of the public. So Helen, uh, <clears throat> Helen undertook a review of the literature and came up um, through, uh, through, through a series of uh, analyses of that literature, came up with a new model for transdisciplinary research that, that is described in that summary figure in the middle of the page. And many people will probably be doing aspects of this this way of working, but we but I think it's helpful to sort of formalize it and to think about how this is important as a process. Um, I think it's something that whilst many people might do it, it's really difficult to do in practice and not all elements of this are possible in practice. But we, you know, I think it has an important element to it if you really want to make a difference. So we start the, 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 the transdisciplinary research model that we described starts with the pre-development phase. And this is where everyone comes together that you want to work on this uh, on, a, on a transdisciplinary research project comes up with the idea of what the research questions might be and the overall vision and aims for that piece of research and then throughout the project with that group that you set out with you undertake co-learning so um, I'm going to talk about this in a bit more detail but this is about understanding with experts by experience with the different research disciplines and with the policy makers coming up with co common languages coming up with um, a common set of ideas about what the problem looks like and and this is a continually iterative process that you reflect and refine throughout the, the projects um, it's often uh, important and helpful to think about a conceptual model for this and so down at the bottom again something I'll come back to later is a model that we developed for our work on migration research where we were trying to understand well how what are the drivers what are the epidemiological drivers that are uh, reducing and or improving health outcomes in this population and then the really the, the kind of more typical phase that many of us will be doing is the investigation so the carrying out of the research the linking of the data um, and then the production of reports and then finish it and then the model finishes with, with an implementation phase. So this is around working with policymakers, working with people in practice to turn uh, that evidence into action, as I described. So what I'll do is just briefly go through a couple of our case studies of the work to illustrate how we do this. So how do we make invisible populations visible and then turn that evidence into action? So a piece of work that we started with uh, back in 2014. Um, I work with the, the fantastic service at University College London Hospital Find and Treat, who uh, provide a mobile outreach uh, screening service for uh, people experiencing homelessness in London. And um, they um, identified quite early on that this group, this is a group that they were focusing on because of the infectious disease uh, conditions that they found in them, but uh, particularly for tuberculosis, so it's a mobile TB screening unit. But they described very high levels of, uh, of other risk factors for conditions, so very high levels of smoking, very high levels of uh, hypertension and cardiovascular disease. Um, and at UCLH, at University College London, they have a fantastic and they had a fantastic and innovative service called the Pathways Team, which is a group of primary care physicians that in reach into the hospital and identify people who are experiencing ho homelessness within the hospital and provide them with primary care and social support during that hospital admission so that when they're discharged, they, were, uh, they get the kind of support that they need and, and hopefully are not readmitted to the hospital. Um, there was a randomized control trial of the pathways model of, of, of in-reaching in, into hospitals. 
And that's been subsequently been rolled out across the country. And what we wanted to do was to look at the real world evidence from uh, these uh, host homeless hospital discharge schemes as they're commonly referred to. So we um, got a, an approval from the uh, confidentiality advisory group in the UK to be able to collect um, unconsented data from these operational ski hospital schemes for people who had been experiencing homelessness and were admitted to hospital and then subsequently discharged. And we took those records of about three and a half thousand people experiencing homelessness. And we linked it to subsequent um, hospital admissions and also to the mortality records that we have in the UK. And so what you'll see on this figure on the right hand side of the screen is an analysis that the Office of National Statistics did using the death certificate data that we have in the UK. And these, uh, and these are death certificates that were taken and, uh, and recorded some form of uh, homelessness uh, code within it. So it was uh, some, there was a mention of homelessness on this person's death certificate. Um, this is a really important piece of work and the ONS have done a fantastic job of doing that. But the limitation with the ONS data is that uh, many of the, the, the death records that get reported in this way and have an indication of homelessness on them are those that go to a coroner. And so as you'll see that the, the, on, on that first bar on the left, actually the number of accidents within that is disproportionately high. Actually, that fits the narrative that most people would have expected, that this is a group of, of people who are experiencing high levels of, of accidents and, and, and get cast, their mortality statistics get classified in this way. But we were a bit um, surprised by that levels. And when we linked our, um, our records of three and a half thousand people to the for, for people who've been experiencing homelessness to the mortality data, we found much lower levels of accidents. So you can see the second bar to the right um, is the, the group of people, the SIHHC group is the group of people who, the three and a half thousand people that we had identified and their subsequent mortality rates. Um, and, there, and then the accidents levels go substantially down. So they go from about 40% to just under so, to just under 20%. And deaths from uh, the dis uh, liver disease, from ischemic heart disease and from cancer, the light brew bit there in the middle is, is deaths from cancer. Uh, were, were much uh, were much higher than expected. And remember, this is the cancer one is particularly important because this is a group that actually, on average, is quite young. Um, so we wouldn't be expecting that many cancer deaths in this group. And when we mapped the deaths to amenable and avoidable mortality, we found that one in three of the people in this cohort was dying from a condition that could be preventable with our current medical knowledge and technology. So we then, we don't, not only did we link to the hospital records, but we were, sorry, to the death records, but we were also able to link to the hospital records for these individuals. <clears throat> and what you'll see here is the 12 month, for that same cohort, three and a half thousand people, what you'll see here is the 12 month risk of readmission stratified by their ICD chapter of index admissions. So on the left hand side of the screen are unplanned readmissions in this population of three and a half thousand people. The middle, the middle figure is the planned readmissions. So these are admissions that upon discharge were planned by the medical team uh, admitting them. And then on the far right is emergency readmissions in that 12 months following. And what emerges from this, for, as a, there's a lot of detail here, I feel a bit like Chris Whitty on his recent um, dis description of coronavirus, com confusing everyone with the amount of data on their slides. But um, that hopefully the t there's, a, there's a kind of broad picture which I hope everyone can see which is in this unplanned readmissions, essentially the homeless group, which is in orange, there's a, there's a, there's a rate of about 60, sorry, there's a risk of about 60% unplanned readmission. And it doesn't matter what that individual was admitted with in the first place. They, that, that consistent unplanned readmissions is, is, is across that group. Whereas you see a bit more of a, a kind of variation in the housed group. However, when it comes to planned admissions, and, the, and the, sorry, and the other really important point is that unplanned admissions obviously much higher than the, the house group in the home in the homeless group. In the planned readmissions, what you'll generally see is that there is this variation by index of, uh, of, of ICD index admission. So you do see the planned levels of readmission varying by what they were admitted for. Uh, and then if we move on to accident and emergency re attendances, again, very high levels in the homeless group, much lower than, much higher than the house group. And just generally across the board, they're high, and it doesn't matter what the index admission was. And this shows to us that, that really that, that we, we need to be doing a better job of planning readmissions and planning the discharge of these people. Um, we, um, going back to the transdisciplinary research model that we've been developed, this work was undertaken from the very start in about 2013, working with experts by experience. And um, 
we undertook work under trying to understand their values and the positive actions that they think that we could do to help improve their uh, their conditions on the street and when they're being housed. Um, but also really importantly, we've involved these experts by experience in the analysis of this data. And the quote at the top of this slide is from James, who's worked on this project throughout and has been in admitted hospital over the years and is now running a homeless hospital in South London. And I think his interpretation and take on the data is extremely important. And it's published on the, the, the paper that hopefully will get published very soon. And he described how for many people who are street homeless, hospital is an inhospitable, if not hostile environment. A single visit or even the street law alone can be enough to cause one to make inventive efforts to disguise one's homelessness in order to receive less visceral and judgmental handling. Certainly it's not an experience anyone would have would rush to embrace. Hence the potentially of fatal avoidance and delay before seeking treatment. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is to, you know, data linkage is a very um, uh, important piece of work, but I think we need to involve experts by experience in the interpretation and the analysis of these data because they can really bring to life some of the issues that, that we uh, as, as, as academics aren't necessarily able to, to understand and also they can help us provide the solution. So James and others have been involved in the co-learning and the development and the conceptualization of that work and we're now working hard with policymakers across government and Department of Health and Housing to, to really invest and, and make sure that the, uh, after the discharge of, of, from hospital for these populations, that they get the sort of care and, and um, follow up they, they need. So moving on slightly uh, to another group that, we've, that I've done a lot of work with over the last few years, um, I want to just briefly talk about migration and the, the, the popular myth that, uh, that, that, that this, pop, this is a group of, of individuals that uh, are disease carriers and pose a risk to resident population, something that was promulgated by the outgoing Donald Trump in his uh, messages about the border wall in, in, in Mexico. So with this um, piece of work, what you'll see on the left hand side is uh, a map of the world and where TB incidence is high, tuberculosis incidence is high around the world. And on the right in red is a map of those countries and the amount of the, the proportion of their population that were born outside that country. And you'll see this inverse correlation between where TB is around the world and those countries that have a high migrant population. And because of this, there's been, um, in the UK in particular, we do have quite low levels of tuberculosis, but actually a lot of the TB that we see is among people who were born outside the UK. And so there's been a lot of bad media about the fact that immigration is leading to tuberculosis uh, in the, and spread in the UK population, and it's going to be a TB time bomb. So we, in the UK, we've been um, screening migrants for tuberculosis for about 10 or 15 years. And I took the, the records from that pre-entry TB screening system and linked it to the National Tuberculosis Register to see if a migrant who's screened as part of their visa application to the UK is screened for TB, uh, what happens to them subsequently in the UK? And we were able to link this to the TB register and also the, the, the very nice and detailed data we have on um, TB strain typing that tells us about uh, whether this TB strain in, in an individual is linked to other cases. And from this, the, major the vast majority of the 500,000 people that entered the UK had no tuberculosis on follow-up. Um, there, there were infectious cases at a rate of about 49 per 100,000, which at the time was uh, that we did this work a few years ago was exactly as expected. And these were infectious cases. So these were cases of TB of the lung. So they were potentially cases that could spread to others through coughing if they weren't treated early. Um, we were able, because we were able to look at the, the molecular epidemiology, we were able to understand, well, how many of these individuals that had TB um, prior to, uh, the, sorry, after arrival in the UK, how many of them could have been prevented if we'd have screened for them for latent tuberculosis? So this is the phase in the TB process whereby they have the disease um, and could be detected and, and given treatment to prevent it. And we found much lower, uh, we, sorry, we found about the, the 49 per 100,000. So not, again, not as unexpected. But the really important finding was that we found very low rates of TB transmission in this population. So with a functioning public health system that is able to identify and treat cases of TB and, and provides free care and access to that population, we found really low evidence of transmission for TB in, in the UK setting. So whilst these individuals themselves do have a high risk of TB compared to the UK born population because of their exposure before moving here, 
actually we 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 didn't find evidence that they were transmitting it to other uh, populations because of the public health access and and treatment that they were getting at the time um sort of um really countering some of the evidence that we we, we see in the, or some of the commentary we see in the, the lay press i'm going to skip over that slide but just to say that this has been work again that um we've um been working with policy makers throughout so the picture on the left bottom left of the screen is a uh, is, is is a group of us that led a lancet commission on migration and health and the and what you'll see in that in that people represented in that group represent human rights lawyers anthropologists hu um, humanitarians there's policy makers from the world health organization from the international organization for migration and one thing i would say that in particular to this piece of work is that when we involve these cross-disciplinary uh, organizations and people within this work it was really important that uh, it was really difficult but it was really important to to get the, the the common language right because lawyers talk differently to to epidemiologists but they have an equal and important role to play in solving this problem so finally as chris um alluded to over the last nine months i'm sure like many people in the audience so we've turned i've turned my hat back to uh, something that i we started working on about 10 years ago so this is a Forest Watch is a community cohort that builds upon um, the work that we we ran in 2006 onwards, looking at influenza transmission in the community. So it's a community cohort um, that builds upon the work that we did on flu, and we're now focusing it on uh, on coronavirus. The particular strand of the work that I'm leading on is built on some an analysis we did back in March, uh, sorry April that looked at standardized mortality ratios by ethnicity in the uk and showed these really stark outcomes by ethnic groups that those uh, though the, the mortality was much higher in um black asian and, and other minority ethnic groups and so the virus watch uh, community cohort we knew that if we ran it in the way that we had done for the last 10 years um we wouldn't be able to recruit sufficient numbers of people from minority ethnic backgrounds and, from, and migrant populations so we uh, added, we applied for specific funding to boost and, and to include a 12 and a half thousand minority ethnic inclusion cohort within this. Um, we are undertaking weekly symptom follow up on this population and I'm pleased to announce that in the virus watch cohort right now, we have just uh, over 42,000 people and around about um, four and a half thousand people who come from a minority ethnic um, or migrant background. We're, we're following them up each week and getting their symptom reporting data. Um, this is still relevant for linkage because we're linking to all of their hospital records uh, and all of the the the, uh, the surveillance data. We're doing a baseline uh, serology and follow up on them, and in a sub cohort of a ten thousand people, we'll be swabbing on a weekly basis if we can get our tests run within the national system over the next week or so, hopefully. Um, and just to end on, uh, uh, we've been, again, on this piece of work, it's been really important to involve experts by experience. And whilst the pandemic has been a really urgent situation, we've done our best. So we have reached out, we have a lay steering, uh, so we have an advisory group that's chaired by a lay member. We've involved Doctors of the World and the Race Equality Foundation and the Running Me Trust, and they're advising us on the recruitment, but also how the analysis and the, the policy implementation of the findings of this study. I'll stop there, but thanks very much for inviting me. Thanks so much, Rob, for a really, uh, for a really interesting and thought-provoking uh, talk. Uh, it certainly reminded me, as I'm sure it's reminded many of you, that as we get into the nitty-gritty of research, we really need to think the doing of the research, so how it sits in a, a, a wider uh, field. Okay, everybody, so we've got, uh, Rob has kept exactly to time, so we've got a good amount of time for questions. Um, as in the uh, previous sessions, then, if you could put the questions uh, in the comment section, and then I'll work through them with Rob. Uh, but perhaps, Rob, if I just could kick off while people are, are getting questions in. So uh, just to turn to your invisible populations, which is it's a really interesting question and an area I've worked in the past. Um, and what I found was, um, you know, really, as you said, compared to maybe more traditional ways of doing research survey instruments, which often leave out you know, these invisible populations, that's why they're invisible. They are visible in the administrative data, but in some ways, in some cases, as you pointed out, in quite complex ways, and you need to think carefully yeah. about the biases. So uh, obviously, you know, engagement with hospitals, that, that they need to have been there. And then 
we found that you know ruthlessness was possibly recorded effectively in the hospital system but other forms of homelessness wasn't because you know it's kind of associated with is there any kind of address you know whether it be a uh, some kind of shelter or a, another person's flat if they're uh, I wonder if you could say a bit more about how you maybe overcame some of those issues or whether you've identified ways of overcoming that yeah there's it's a really interesting thing and we have definitely learned over the, so that, that project took about seven years in total and and uh from inception to, to finishing it and we've learned a lot along the way um so the the way we identified people experiencing homelessness was by by literally using the operational records from the services and so it was so the group is very diverse it's heterogeneous because it's based on whoever that how, how they were however each hospital defined it since doing that work we've actually been doing some analysis with the hospital episode statistics in the uk and um as you've you've mentioned um it is possible now to identify using icd coding within those records um ruthlessness and and there's an icd code for homelessness within that and Cyrilla Luchensky, who's working with us right now, uh, is on, she's, a, well, she's on maternity leave right now, but is working on this, has been doing some really interesting work validating how, how, what size of the cohort you can identify just using the anonymized ICD codes uh, from the hospital records. And it looks like going forward, actually, there's been a, because of the focus on this group and their hospital emissions, there's been a, an increase in the recording of those ICD-10 codes. And I think actually it will be a resource that many people could use going forward. And I and I probably would even recommend not doing the sort of research that we've done in the past because it's so time consuming and potentially uh, onerous. Um, and I think actually, you know, there is the opportunity in the UK at least to do that. But, and, but I think it really to the, you know, I, it should be congratulated, the hospital and clinicians and services in hospitals should be congratulated for the recording of that going, that those those uh, those markers in the hospital records, because it will, it's only because of the focus that they've had on that, that we're now able to identify those. And similarly, the primary care records, we've, we've done some work looking at primary care records, and again, the, the recording of homelessness and drug use in those records has been, it has really been improving over the last five to six years, and we think that they, they again will be more useful going forward. Great, thanks, Rob. So there's a uh, that, that's that's really interesting and helpful. So there's a, a few other questions now on the uh, homeless. I'll I'll just try. Uh, I'll probably just read them out. So so Lisa Sharwood's asked. Um, so interested uh, in the uh, reducing in accidents percentage between the ONS and the I think that's the hospital data, isn't it? However, the yeah. percentage of all other causes increased by about 15%. Could this have been uh, accidents that were just misclassified, do you think? Yeah, I don't, it's an interesting point. I mean, obviously we um, <clears throat> we don't know the individual uh, deaths and, and, and we don't know the, uh, the coroner's reports for those. Um, I think um, it's unlikely to be the case because of, particularly because of this focus on if, if it is an accident, it's quite often referred to the coroner uh, in the UK, particularly sure. for someone who's experiencing homelessness. So I think that's unlikely to be the case. Um, I think it's yeah. more to do with the fact that, it, that and, and, and so there are some biases and there are very important biases, differences between the ONS cohort and our cohort. So, they, so our cohort was, a, you know, they by, by nature of how we selected them, they were in hospital. So they would be more likely to, to be those individuals who have cancer and who have cardiovascular disease because that's where they're being treated for it. But I think, as a general, you know, and I think the truth, there is no truth for the for the for the kind of causes of death in this group, if as it were. Uh, and I think what so in the paper we go to great lengths to describe the, those the you know those two extremes and, and actually that maybe the the reality is somewhere in between. Yeah. Great. Thanks. So we've got a question on the the sort of uh, technicalities here from Miran Smith. So she, she's asking, could you comment on where and how the data linkage was done? Uh, I guess you could save that for either of your. <laughs> projects, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, no, I, I, I um, didn't. I deliberately didn't put that slide up because it takes a long while to explain. But for the homeless yeah. um, cohort, the, the way that that it worked is we. So we worked with seventeen sites across the country that were providing care for people experiencing homelessness, and we went. We got a uh, an approval from the Secretary of State for Health. Uh, 
to be able to collect those records that had identifiable information. So it had information on their names, their dates of birth and their NHS numbers. Um, and we went to those sites and we collected and cleaned those data at the hospitals and then uploaded it onto our secure data safe haven at UCL. So that gave us a list of, um, I can't remember the number exactly, but around, so let's say around 5,000 individuals who were experiencing homelessness and had been seen by one of these sites. Um, <clears throat> We then sent that list of identifiers to NHS Digital, uh, who uh, using the NHS number and the other demographic information, because the NHS number was missing on a lot of them, they used their algorithm, which is a little bit opaque or was at the time about how they do the linkage, but essentially they link primarily on an NHS number um, and then on, uh, on demographics uh, and then sent us back the, the hospital records. So obviously the, the linkage here is, is somewhat problematic because it does rely on the NHS number being recorded, but the fact by virtue of the fact that these were individuals in hospital, there's fairly good comprehensive recording of NHS number. We did initially start out trying to use the, the as a comparison group, trying to use the cohort from the find and treat ban that I very briefly mentioned, which was we thought yeah. well, we could use a community cohort as a, as a, as a comp control group, but we gave up on that because of linkage issues and we didn't feel like it was correctly linking cor probably. So we decided just to focus on those that had the better quality linkage. Um, we, we had quite good, high, quite high linkage rates. Um, and, and so we had, and, and we did a lot of work thinking about the biases within the linkage, but hopefully that just sort of describes briefly how the linkage was performed. The migrant one is even more complicated because they don't even have an NHS number, but we had, I, we did it, prob I validated probabilistic linkage uh, for that and was able to use full identifiable information at Public Health England for that piece of work. Yeah. I mean, I guess these populations always, because they're sort of on the edge of society often that they, you know, they're, they're, uh, getting an official number uh, or whatever is always harder so it's always going to be a, uh, a more yes. difficult process and they often yeah. have multiple different nhs numbers uh, particularly the right, people yeah. experiencing homelessness uh, when they get admitted to different hospitals they get a, a new nhs number so we did try and think about that as well within this and, and kind of cleaning that that list yeah so so rob you had someone commenting that they really like the term uh experts by experience and actually I like it as well actually and I'll, mm. I'll try and use that I wonder if you could say a, a bit about what, what was your so how how did the research change because of that in, engagement or was it the interpretation of it what what, what what was the sort of the end product of that engaged strong yeah. engagement I think um it's uh there's no one thing that changed it changed because it changed so many things um I think you know uh, the focus, you know, they, the, I can actually give a better, probably an easier example to the one that I gave um, on the talk, which is the work that I've been doing on migration. So when we, when I started out the migration work, um, we would, we would, you know, very much focused on infectious diseases. And when I engaged with people experiencing and who'd been migrants and migrated to the UK, I showed them my plans. They said, well, where's mental health? You know, what, what's going on with, you know, this is all very interesting. You're going to look at cardiovascular disease. You're going to do your, all of your infectious disease. But actually for us, mental health is a really big um, issue. Um, and so they, they not only changed the focus of the research, but the research questions. And they've also been uh, engaging in uh, and working with, uh, with experts by experience helps understand the recruitment processes for these projects helps understand the analysis and I show the analysis involved and involve uh, people in the in the in the in, the, in literally in the, re the research articles uh, so that you know and, and and the contextualization of that data can be really important um, and I think so I think it's not just one thing it's everything but yeah. it's hard work it's really difficult to do I don't you know and I think that's why it doesn't get done as, as often as it could do but it's really rewarding and 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 and, uh, and important, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. So there's a a question um, which I get, I guess, is because you're little to it to uh, a chance to expand on it. That you you talked about doing work with incarcerated populations, but didn't really get a chance to uh, expand on it. So someone's interested if you could say a bit more about the nature of that work. Yeah. Um, so, so I've done somewhat less work on the incarcerated populations. Rather, so the, the piece of work that I've led on that was the overall review that that looked at the mortality outcomes. Um, <clears throat> so the work really on in that area has been has been uh, led by Chantelle Edge at University College London. She's a public health registrar, and she's been looking at telemedicine and in reach in 
uh, in, in incarcerated populations and particularly during the pandemic she's been focused on how we um, how we how we reduce transmission of coronavirus within our within our prison population. So I, I'm a bit less involved in in that side of the work, but but the wider inclusion health group at UCL that's led by Andrew Hayward does more does does, does a substantial amount of work on that. So that's probably why I didn't talk so much about it as well. No, no, that's fine. Yeah, uh, and I, I guess everybody that we're probably this is the the last uh, question um, because we're coming to the close of this session. Uh, but Derek Lopez asks about uh, frailty, uh, and I, I, mm. I assume uh, about within the homeless population, but maybe if they want to comment. So is there much work done in this area looking at frailty and the progression into frailty for this population? I, as I said, I, think, I assume it, it's that's the homeless population. Yeah, no, it's a really important point. Um, and, we, you know, we so biological age is, is isn't always a particularly helpful uh, uh, indicator in, in that group. Um, the we as a group are not doing much on that area, but there's some really important work in the US um, led by Jim uh, we, Withers, I think his name is uh, in Harvard uh, or at Boston, um, and they're looking at this. And it's, it's a really important point, as is end of life care, as is and as is you know palliative care. And um, yeah, so I think it's a, there isn't enough work done on that, and we need to do more on that. And and I think that it's an yeah. important point to make. Yeah, can you get at it at all in administrative data? Do you think, or is that something that you really have to rely on? Other uh, yeah, frailty. I think yeah. I don't think you would be able to. I think you'd have to do surveys uh, for that. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I'm not sure I would know how to get at frailty within administrative no. data. I'd be interested yeah. to know if anyone does know. <laughs> yes, yes. So, may, any ideas? Then do put it in the comments. But uh, probably uh, we should draw the session to a, a close now. But just. Uh, just if I could say a, a really big thanks to uh, Rob for a really interesting talk and thanks to all the people that participated uh, today, especially those that are, are up late in the, in the night, <laughs> um, some past midnight. Uh, so, uh, so thanks very much, everybody. Um, and uh, uh, thanks again to Rob. Yeah, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity.